Welcome to Global Perspectives. What is the state of politics, race, and culture in the United States? Pulitzer Prize winning writer Leonard Pitts specializes in all three. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Leonard. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. There's so much going on, I don't know where to start. Yeah, but yeah. why don't we start with the politics piece of that trio? Okay. What, what is your assessment of where we are in light of the recent election and other things that have been happening in the United States over the past couple of years? I think that many of us are in where we are is, is a state called shock. Uh, I think that uh, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a place of great uncertainty as to uh, you know, where we go from here. Uh, Mr. Trump was elected without speaking at any great length about any policy issues or plans, uh, with the exception of building a wall on the southern border. And uh, I believe uh, you know, he articulated some tax plans, but other than that, we we really don't have any any great idea of who or what uh, this this uh, this administration is going to be. So there is beyond the the initial shock of the election for some of us. There is this uh, there is this uncertainty. Uh, we're waiting to see where, where 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 do we go from here. Some people draw comfort from the possibility that he will surround himself with competent individuals and others aren't persuaded that that's going to happen. What, what do you feel? You count me among the unpersuaded. I don't believe that. I believe that in Mr. Trump's world, competence equates to uh, your, your, your level of adoration of Mr. Trump. <laughs> I don't think, I, I think that that is how competence is determined. So I don't expect that uh, we're going to see a lot of, we're not going to see a lot of no men or no women uh, in, in his administration, and we're not going to see uh, people whose competence is judged by their actual ability to, to do a thing or to think through or to analyze or, or their knowledge. Their competence is essentially going to be judged by their loyalty to, uh, to him, which is a bad way to, uh, to, to assemble uh, an administration, in my, in my view. Talk to us about the way the state of politics has evolved in the United States. It's, it's become so so contentious, so divided, and the, the recent election was a, as good an example of that as any. Um, is that something that you think will be part of our future, or do you feel we might at some point begin to move back toward so-called common ground? Well, let me take issue first with your, with your word choice. Uh, I don't think it has evolved. I think it has devolved. Mm -hmm. uh, I think politics, uh, and this did not begin with, with Mr. Trump. This has been going on in increments for probably the last... 20 years or so, uh, politics has become proxy for a whole lot of other things. Politics has become proxy for cultural resentments and for demographic fears and for, and for a whole bunch of other things that really have not a whole lot to do with policy except insofar as policy is used to express them. But uh, it, it, it's, 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 you know, we're, we're not arguing about small government versus large government. Mm -hmm. even, even when we use those words, we're not arguing about it. We're not arguing about uh, tax relief versus higher taxes or any of these things. We are arguing about black versus white. We are arguing about Christian versus Muslim. We are arguing about gay, ver uh, that we're talking about, arguing about straight versus LGBT. Uh, Q. That those are the arguments that we're having right now, even when we don't use those words. And politics, as I said, has just become a um, has become a proxy for that. There's, I read this once, and the story may be apocryphal, but it really kind of speaks to how we view these the, 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 these political terms and the ideologies that that that, that describe them. Guy is uh, crossing the street. A pedestrian is crossing the street, and he's doing it too slowly, and the driver. Uh, who is waiting there for, for the pedestrian to clear the crosswalk, leans out of his uh, car and yells, get out of the way, you damn liberal. <laughs> and this, this is what I mean when I say that politics, the, you know, the, the, the language has become, has become proxy for liberal no longer mean in the mind of many people, liberal no longer means a set of political or, or philosophic beliefs. Liberal means that which threatens me and which I don't like. Mm -hmm. How do we get past all of this, or can we get all, uh, past all of this? I think that it took us a long time to get into this, and I believe, frankly, it's going to take us to, if we get out of it, okay. I think it's going to take us a long time to get out. I think that it begins with something very unsexy that people don't want to talk about, but I think it begins with education. I think that a lot of what we are seeing, and particularly this fear, fear is, is often rooted in ignorance. 
and I think that there is a great deal of ignorance, there's a great deal of objectification of those quote unquote other people. I think there's a, there's a, there's a great, you, you tend to fear what you don't know. Uh, and I think that even in this hyper-connected society, there's a lot of us who are sort of insulated in our communities where everybody looks like us, everybody thinks like us, everybody is like us, so we don't know anybody who's transgender, we don't know anybody who's African American, we don't know anybody who's Muslim, we don't know those who are not like us. So they are that other tribe over there on the other side of town, the other side of the hill, and they're coming to get us. So the, the, the solution to that or the, the cure for that is, is, is education. The cure for that is to, is to have people know people and, and, and learn not to be afraid of people who are not like them. Uh, the cure for that is, is a reinvestment in civic education. It appalls me how little so many of us know about the fundamentals of, of, of our own country. That includes the, the, the president-elect. Uh, I remember when he said during the campaign that we need to get the, the Supreme Court to investigate Hillary's emails. The Supreme Court is not an investigative body and it does not act at the behest of the president. The Supreme Court is the judiciary. But it, it, you know, it's that level of, of, of granular, simple knowledge of, of how the country works that seems to be, that seems to be missing for a lot of us. So those, you know, the, those two pieces, and I'll, I'll add one more, is uh, you know, the, we seem to have devolved into a nation where fact doesn't matter, doesn't carry the weight that it once did and then, and then, and then, and then it should. We need to also, in terms of education, get back to, te get back to people understanding that facts have to have primacy. I don't care what you believe. I'm, I'm, I'm less interested in, I tell students all the time, I'm less interested in what you think than that you think. Mm -hmm. If you have a different opinion than I do, I can respect that opinion even if I disagree, it's, disagree with it, so long as you can show me that it is, is based in some verifiable fact and that there is a reasonable chain of logic that brought you there. And that is, that doesn't seem to be a lot to ask, but you don't, you don't get that so much anymore. So those are the places where I would, you know, look to, 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 to improve if we're going to improve. You mentioned Trump's reference to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and the, the, the lack of knowledge or, right. or insight, but then the audience responded to that with a tremendous cheer. And so if there's a lack of information on one side and the other, how is education going to work its way in? Well, I don't know that, frankly, and this is going to sound unbearably <laughs> pessimistic, I don't know that the generation that is of age now that, 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 that applauded the people that you're talking about, I don't know that they are salvageable. I mm. don't, I, I, when I say education, I'm talking about the from, generations, from the, from. You know, the generations coming. I don't know that they, are, that they are salvageable. I don't know that there's anything that can be done for a 55 year old, or in Mr. Trump's case, a 70 year old, who believes the Supreme Court should investigate Hillary Clinton. I don't know what, what we say to that person. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we do with that person. Uh, but I do believe that the, grand, the child or grandchild of that person who is in high school, who is in college, uh, can perhaps be taught the fundamental civics and history of this country so that they don't grow up with the same incorrect uh, beliefs. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with you. I think education is the key to, to much of this. And yeah. Have and, and, and so if that's true, then how, how would you approach this whole issue area? Uh, uh, we're talking about um, special programming in elementary schools, getting st you know, students involved early in these yeah. discussions, because a lot of the young, young people have participated in large numbers in some elections and not so much in others. And, you and I were talking about this before, and you said you know, people tend to be reactive rather than right. proactive, and I think we saw that in, in the recent election and the protests that followed, but it was also an election in which young people didn't participate as much yeah. uh, as they did in 2012 or, or, or 2008. But um, how young is too young to get started, or should you start as, as soon as they're aware of things? I remember being taught civics in the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, so I, I, I don't know, you know, th that seemed to me the, the right time to begin learning, what, you know, this is what the First Amendment uh, means, and the, the, here's, here's the Bill of Rights, and here's the, the right to vote, and all these other things. I began being taught, and obviously it was on a, it was on a child's level, mm -hmm. but I remember being taught that in, in, in fifth grade, so I don't, I, don't, I don't know when is too early. I know when is too late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, as I said, 50 and 70 are probably a little bit too late, but I, I don't know when is too early. Uh, th the thing is, and nobody talks about this, but uh, in, the, in the, I guess it was in the 90s, the 80s and 90s, we had this whole push for back to basics education. Mm -hmm. uh, we lost music, we lost physical education, and we lost art, but we also lost history and civics. They're not taught so much anymore. And if you look at some of the studies uh, and the reports that have been coming out the last 10, 15 years, they're really heartbreaking. Our best and brightest students, I forget the exact percentage, but some large percentage, some majority of our best and brightest students at the top colleges uh, can't tell you the significance of Valley Forge, cannot identify you know, a, a, a cause of, 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 the, uh, of the Korean War, cannot identify and give you the significance of the Gettysburg Address. That's huge. That's seismic, because these are the things, as Americans, we do not all share the same place of origin on the planet, ancestral place of origin on the planet. We, we, we don't share the same, you know, America, American culture is a bunch of different cultures that come from Japan, that come from Kenya, that come from Ireland, all, you know, so we, we, don't, we don't have all of that. The thing that we're supposed to have as Americans is the shared culture and the shared, uh, uh, not shared culture, the shared um, uh, uh, values, the, the, the shared belief in, in the truths that Thomas Jefferson said were held self-evident. And if we don't know those, if those are not being taught, then you have to ask yourself, what really binds us together? It's significant to me, people talked to, after 9-11, of the country has finally come together. Yeah, you will always come together when somebody else is trying to kill you. You know, there, there are a few of us here in the studio right now. People started banging on the doors and, you know, we'd become a family real quick, mm -hmm. okay? When somebody's trying to kill you, you will, and the same thing happened after, after Pearl Harbor. But we need to, as Americans, find a way to, to come together that does not require people trying to kill us. And, and, and the thing that is supposed to do that is our belief in and our upholding of those truths that we claim to be so sacred. We hold these truths to be self-evident. And if those things are not being taught, if they're not being passed on to our kids, if our kids don't know about Normandy and Gettysburg mm -hmm. and, and, and the moon landing and the Marshall Plan and all these things that, that, that are sources of our pride, if they don't know that the Supreme Court does not investigate uh, you know, presidential candidates, if they don't know these basic fundamental things about our country, then what holds us together in the end? No, it's a good question. I was in a conversation the other day with other adults, mm -hmm. and somebody referenced the Louisiana Purchase for some reason. Right. One of them was sort of half listening, said, what did they buy in Louisiana? Just zero recognition of what was that. And it was funny, but it was also sad. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, I, and, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and your point about the relative absence now of music and culture yeah. and so many other things. I, I remember being in the fifth grade, we had an organ in the classroom and you would take turns going up there throughout the day mm -hmm. and putting on your, your earphones and having your 10, 15 minutes, whatever you didn't have much, right. but, but uh, I can't even imagine that in most public school classrooms today. You probably remember as I do being taught American folk songs, she'll mm -hmm. be coming around the mountain mm -hmm. when she comes and stuff. That's not taught anymore. Mm -hmm. And again, the, the, these are the things that, that there, there are certain things that bind us in, in, in this country, and they're not like in, in Japan, you, pretty much, I, I, and I, I've never been to that country, but as I understand it, you can be born in that country and look like me, but you are not quote unquote Japanese, mm -hmm. okay? There's, there's, there's an ethnic homogeneity or whatever you want to call it there. We don't have that here. We come to this country from, from all parts of the globe. So there are, there are things that bind us that we have to, we have to, we have to maintain and we have to, we have to have respect for. Culture used to bind us, I mean, uh, entertainment culture, it doesn't anymore. There was a time when everybody, you know, in the 50s, everybody watched Lucy. Mm -hmm. Movie, stu uh, the, the movie houses would plan around Lucy. Dinner uh, restaurants would 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 experience a drop when Lucy was on. Okay, and every you know, even if we came, I'm on, I'm on this side of town, you're on that side of town, but we all watched Lucy on Vitamin D Vegemin. We all were on the Ponderosa. We all were in Mayberry. 
we are not that anymore. No. There, are, there are TV shows that are huge hits that I've never seen because we've got 500 channels. Okay, you're watching, you're watching Orange is the New Black, that, that's fine. I'm watching Empire or whatever. I'm watching something else, and these are huge hits, but they don't, that, but they don't bind us in the way that, that, that we were once bound. So I think we've been very careless or very, uh, we haven't really tended this garden. We, we have not really uh, been, been treated with, 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 the, with, the, with the care and the attention that we should, the, the idea or, or the things that bind us. Uh, and as a result, as, those, as, as culture goes its way, and now we, we don't teach civics, we don't teach history, I get back to the question I asked a moment ago, what binds us? What makes, what makes us Americans? And, and also, a lot of the content, if you go back several decades, mm -hmm. wasn't adequate. You, you had just a very, very brief piece of information, if any, in a lot of the history books about yeah. the civil rights movement, yeah. about slavery, and so forth. And now there seems to be more of that kind of content. But, but still not enough. I mean, these well, are issues that we have kind of pushed away, and, and it seems that if we're going to have that common experience, if we're going to understand each other better, we mm -hmm. need to have more of that kind of content. Actually, I think it's even less. Um, I, I wasn't taught a whole lot when I was growing up, and I was, I was in school during the Civil Rights Movement, so obviously that wouldn't have been in the books yet. I was given probably the basics of, of, of slavery and the Civil War, but it wasn't anything that, it was, that was gone into any depth on. But what we've seen in, the last, in, in this last generation is a conscious effort to, to whitewash all that stuff completely out of the books. You, you may remember the, the uh, controversy in Texas where uh, a woman uh, raised heck with McGraw Hill because they had a textbook describing uh, slaves as immigrants and workers. <laughs> um, in Jefferson County, Colorado, I believe it was, students walked out of their schools because of a, uh, a conservative uh, school board member had pushed through a measure that required uh, the teaching of, of only that history that, that glorifies America and don't teach history that, te that, that, that might cause people to have a disrespect for the law. Well, there goes the civil rights movement because the civil rights movement was founded on principled disobedience to the law. Uh, you have, uh, and it's not just matters of, of, of race and culture, you have, uh, text, you have places now where students, uh, where teachers are not allowed to say the word evolution, where they are required to speak to quote unquote biological changes over time. <laughs> so I think, yeah, so I think that we are seeing, uh, we, we are seeing, you know, this, this sort of stuff erased uh, the stuff that is that is politically sensitive that that offends uh, what what some conservatives would like to believe about our history about science or whatever uh, is being systematically removed from the curriculum. You, you wrote a novel about the the slave era. Yeah, Freeman. And Freeman, and um, there was something in there about the, the the taint that can never be removed or something like that. I don't know if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. I don't know if that was in the book or if you were talking about the issue. I don't recall that specific line from the from the book, but that that is something that that I would say. And that, that's the thing. That's kind of something that people want to run from. Uh, somebody asked me how long, you know, how long do we have to deal with with with, with this? The answer is forever. Mm -hmm. That's why these things are so awful. Dealey Plaza will never not be the place where John Kennedy was assassinated. Auschwitzium in, in Poland will never not be the place that Auschwitz was located and all these billions of Jews were exterminated. The American South will never not be the place where slaves were, were, were held and, and, and people were brutalized and we had to fight a war and 650,000 uh, uh, Americans uh, perished. Uh, to, to, you know, in, in that war. So, you know, these, these crimes, that's what makes these crimes so great, so momentous, and so monstrous is because they mark a place forever. Mm -hmm. And that's why, one, that, 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 that's what makes them sacred, but that's why you, you, you try, <laughs> that's why you try not to commit these crimes. And that's why when they are committed, you try to, to commemorate and to, and to mark and to, and, to, and to know what happened there because the shadow, the shadow goes forever. The shadow exists forever and and this whole idea of okay well it's been it's been 50 years can we stop talking about Jim Crow now I don't I, I, I was about to say I don't understand that but I do understand that you, you, you don't want to talk about Jim Crow because it makes you feel bad because it makes you it, it gives you some sense of, of, of guilt 
Uh, I admire, and I've never been there, but from what I've seen on, on film and documentary or whatever, I admire what Germany has done because that nation has, has institutionalized memory and required, and required the recollection of the Holocaust. In this country, we have done the opposite. We have run from and tried to put a time limit on the commemoration of the crimes that were done in our name, and that is precisely the wrong thing. That is, and the, the, the object is not to make you feel bad forever. The object is to make you say, this happened, this happened here, and therefore I am obligated to say never again. I'm obligated as a human being to say that, I can, that, that this can never happen again. And, and, and one irony of the slavery issue in particular mm -hmm. is that it wasn't something that happened for just a short period of time. No. It, it was preceded by slavery existing th from the beginning of organized human society, and mm -hmm. after slavery was abolished mm -hmm. around the world, it continued in, in different forms, mm -hmm. and now, unfortunately, is on the rise and, and probably yeah, at its greatest world. level in, in history in terms of the number of people affected. So yeah. if anything, that that history is more relevant than ever. Yeah, but again, in America, we are we are <laughs> we are fixated on healing and closure, <laughs> you know, and other and other pop psychology buzzwords, and that's all that's all well and good. But I think that pain have pain has lessons to teach us, as well. Remembrance has lessons to teach us. Reverence has lessons to teach us. We've just been uh, very unwilling students. Well, speaking of students, you, you referenced the need for better and earlier education mm -hmm. about civics and, and other related topics in, in the public schools. What about the role of institutions such as news organizations to educate? I know there's always been this debate, you know, mm -hmm. do we provide the, the news that readers and viewers want to see or do we do that plus some other things that are important? So we want to feed them in, you know, maybe smaller doses, the things that they need to know about. Yeah, I would come down on, 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 on the side of, of news plus because I don't think, uh, particularly now, I don't think that a, that a news organization can take for granted that the audience is going to know the things out of which the current, whatever the current headline, they're not going to know the things out of which those headlines spring. Uh, so I would, I would, I would say that you know there, there's a need to uh, there's need to tell what the current story is, but I also need to know where it comes from. Too many of us, particularly, and I hate to sound like a crotchety old get off my lawn type of guy, <laughs> but too many of us uh, in, in, in younger generations have been able to get away with sort of a 20-year time frame <laughs> that, that nothing really happened of of of, of, of value that, that or that impacts what I'm seeing before I got here. And I tell my I tell my young people, my kids all the time. That's like walking into the middle of the movie, and and trying to and trying to to know what's going on and trying to understand the plot. You can't know the plot of the movie unless you have some sense of what came on, what what came before you walked in. And it's the same with 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 understanding where the country is right now. Uh, you have to understand something of where we come from before you can understand where we are, or you can help to to to, to direct where we're going. And until until we, we, we get until they get to that, we're always going to be in this muddle. So what what, what by, by any means necessary, including the news media, I think that we need to we need to educate in, in, in terms of uh, the history of, of this country, these conflicts in the world. You you have a certain humility about you that is very refreshing. It makes you accessible, and yet you know, Pulitzer Prize and all yeah. kinds of other awards, multiple books. Yeah, the, the prominence of your, your column is there for everyone to see. But you describe yourself first and foremost as simply a writer. Yeah. Uh, how do you stay humble <laughs> with all the accolades? What, what's the old joke? I have plenty to be humble about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think accolades have to be put into their proper place. They're, they're lovely. They're great for days when, when, you're, when, you're, having, when you're having a diff difficult time with the work. You know, I like the, sometimes when, when when the work is really hard, I'll go look at the Pulitzer, which is in a, in a case in my office, and say, "Okay, I, I can do this." There was a, there was a time I was okay at this. You know, I kind of knew how to do this. But I think that the danger, if, the danger with accolades, is that you can begin to believe your own hype, and that you can become less less hungry, less determined to be a little to be a little bit better the next day. Than, than you were. There's a there's a sports story that I like, which really kind of speaks to how I see 
what I do and how I, I think people should appro approach craft. Magic Johnson came into the uh, NBA, I guess it was 1979, great season, first season with the Lakers, uh, wins a championship, MVP of, the final, of the, the final game, et cetera, et cetera, you know, great year. And he spends the, the off season working on his, I think it was his three-point shot, trying to get better. So that when he comes back the next year, he's better than he was in this in this great first year. To me, that's the minds that you've got to have. I think that the mo I think the contentment, creatively speaking, contentment is 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 where you begin to die. So I think that you always have to uh, you always have to stay humble and you always have to 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 continue working to 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 get better. I always tell people I'm I'm working trying to become a better writer. Well, thank you. And with that, we'll, we'll, we'll close for today. But we really appreciate having you here today, Leonard. It's my pleasure. I've enjoyed the conversation. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.